Yes, I'm ready for this. The top 10 that I've been wanting to do for months now. Mech suits, alien themed smart guns, juggernauts, and apocalyptic loadouts. This is going to be fun. Big shout outs go to everyone who spanked that like button on the first portion of this episode. In that episode, we went over 10 other loadouts like this one, this one, and even this one. I also showed off dozens of other loadouts from people all around the world. And today we'll be doing all that over again in this rendition of the Airsoft Top Series. I am pretty excited about this, so let's just jump into the second part of the Top 20 Unique Airsoft Loadouts. First off though, I'd like to thank the Airsoft Heretics page on Facebook for their big support for this episode, where most of these loadouts were submitted like this modern Mandalorian kit with custom built helmet and vest by Daniel or this awesome kit I'm surprised I haven't seen yet by Ignis. I hope you Team Fortress 2 players like the Scout loadout because it's Ignis' favorite game, so he just had to put this together. He made the headset himself, and the shotgun is a nice and simple SEMA M3 using Tokimaru shells with an atomizer baseball bat. Yep, I like this, and I just had to show it off before we break into a top 10 beginning with CJ Hayes. We start off strong with something built to run the classic army M132 microgun. Dubbed the Titan, this juggernaut setup was built for a C3 airsoft event held at GamePod. Amazingly, this loadout only cost CJ less than $100 apart from the weapons, and unlike Jared and Jacob's entries, this Titan was built by handcrafted leather and plastic, while the helmet up top is just a modified snowboard helmet with a die i4. I shouldn't need to explain why the judges loved this one, but I personally liked how threatening this looked. I just imagine someone not seeing CJ before a game started just to be confronted by him later as he blasts people in CQB distances with a mini minigun. Pretty much just an altogether and great and fun setup by CJ Hayes. Next, I have my favorite World War I loadout I've ever seen and honestly, I would like to build the same loadout myself, but figure out a way to make the wool German jacket less itchy. Now I do get a lot of Milsom stuff submitted for these shows, so if 19 is my favorite historical loadout, then Ethan's amazing loadout is my favorite modern one. Made of a Fort Caviar RSP with a visor and a Fort Fortress Mod K frag suit, which has to be heavy, and an LST PP19 with probably a lot more in the parts department. Ethan's loadout was my favorite modern day kit that was turned in, but this is Thomas's World War I German kit. When I asked why he thought this loadout was special, I was happy to see Thomas's response, and he's very passionate about this build. I think what's special about my kit is that not many people do these kinds of historical loadouts. Modern kits are just easy to put together compared to something like my World War I German kit. Although the build cost of a historical loadout may be around the same as a modern one, depending on where you get your equipment from. It's finding a suitable gun and to put it all together that makes it a bit more challenging. M4s, AKs, VSRs, etc. are always being made and upgraded on the market, so finding parts and pieces for them is easy. However, vintage guns, especially World War I guns, are harder and sometimes even require you to make your own gun, which my friend and I did with my MP28, which we converted from a Sten gun into an MP28. I think in the end, it's how badass the kit looks that really makes people turn their heads to see something so uncommon, so bizarre, yet so cool. Honestly, anyone can do these types of loadouts if they set their mind, effort, and dedication to it, and of course, their wallets. Thomas did spend about $1,500 to $2,000, and all that went towards the longest parts list for this countdown which consists of an M16 Stilhelm from Epic Militaria that was repainted with 1944 Militaria's helmet paint and Kiwi Brown's liquid shoe polish. Then we have a surplus East German long shovel with a Minowax Dark Walnut 2716 stained handle, an M1917-18 gas mask from Zib Militaria that was darkened with Kiwi Brown shoe polish, M1907 infantry shoulder boards from Mandalign, an M1907 through 1910 tunic from MTL, an M1895 Turnster backpack from MTL, an M1893 Brown Zelt Bond from MTL, a gray wool blanket from Henson Antique, Brown Zelt Bond equipment straps from EM, Zelt Bond poles and carry bag from MTL, a German mess kit, 
shoulder straps from a Chinese officer belt, a World War I Iron Cross second class ribbon from EM, a World War I Silver Womb Badge from EM, a leather C96 Woodstock holster set from IMA USA, which goes with the C96 Woodstock that was also restained with Minowax Dark Walnut 2716. Then we have a pair of World War I G98 ammo pouches from MTL, a G98 bayonet with sheath from Atlantic Cutlery, a G98 bayonet frog from MTL, darkened with Kiwi's brown shoe polish, again, black leather gauntlets from Historical Emporium, a 1909 Prussian belt buckle from MTL, an 1895 combat field belt from MTL again, a lovely Marushan PFC C96 with short mag, a leather tool pouch, M1907 and 15 Felgrove trousers from MTL, an M1917 gas mask carry bag from MTL, Hoblil Nest jack boots from Soldier of Fortune, an M1907 canteen from MTL, an M1907 1 liter canteen cup, aluminum, from MTL again, go figure, an M1914 Pioneer Spaten tool shovel carry cover, and finally, the WonderCon 2018 badge, since this loadout is taken to con the con to show to show quite a bit. Yeah, so think about that for a second. You might see his World War I historical loadout at a comic convention or even an anime convention sometime. I admire this loadout so much that I had to share it on my Instagram at US Airsoft YouTube for how well put together it is. It's just so rare to see something like this done properly and not skimped out halfway through or something. Thomas gets my seal of approval for this kit and I'm sure he gets a lot more people's attention as well. Great work Thomas, you deserve all the respect. Horror movies. Do you like them? No, this isn't leading to a Jason Voorhees loadout. Whatever that would look like. Nah, I was thinking more like... Aliens? Or is that a thriller movie? Oh yeah, we're going there. This is Luke with his fully functional M56 smart gun loadout. From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, this M56 smart gun loadout from the film Aliens is valued at about $1,500. And it took about five months to put the bulk of this all together, with pieces, namely more movie accurate components of the loadout being added periodically. Luke said that he believes this loadout is special as it's one of very, very, very few that exist in the world, being a full size, full metal, fully functional airsoft replica of the smart gun from Aliens and I agree with him. It is capable of firing from both the rear lever as well as the red switch on the forward grip control, the same way the real one is supposed to fire. Both of these controls also simultaneously wind the 2500 round drum magazine. The forward grip control also houses a built-in safety, as well as power switch to engage the green laser to assist in aiming. It has a functioning ammo counter that counts up from zero, then resets when a new drum is placed in the gun. The replica is powered by an 11.1 volt LiPo battery, disguised as our take on the battery used to power the smart gun in the film. The entire build is metal, weighing in roughly at about 40 pounds. It is supported though by a gimbal on the left side of the gun that mounts onto the support arm connected to the camera stabilizer rig. The shoulder lamp is 2500 lumens and completely kit bashed, using electrical fittings and custom components to make it very similar to the one used in the film. The headset though is purely cosmetic, mostly just parts made from collector's pieces and cosplay components. It's made almost completely the same way as the one used in the original film though, so that's pretty good. Personally though, I want to see more stuff like this, more sci-fi movie film stuff. Like where all the super trooper loadouts. The Star Wars guys showed up, but Luke would have still squashed them with how great this loadout turned out. Yes, I love this loadout and I am happy that I got to feature it on my show because before opening up the submission pools for this countdown, I had no idea someone made this loadout come to the real world. I hope you alien fans enjoy the photos you're seeing right now on the screen because I don't know where else you would see something like this. But thank you Luke for turning in your loadout for the Airsoft Top Series. Advancing from the gimbal used for Luke's loadout, next we have the beginning of something truly awesome. I've seen this man's video about his project before putting this show together, and now I get to talk about Ross Radford. Ross Radford, who's a part of the Awesome Explosives Enterprises Airsoft team from Alexandria, Virginia, have put together what they call the EE-03 Siegfried, an unpowered load-bearing exoskeleton for airsoft use with a classic army M132 microgun connected to one arm and an AGM MG42 on the other one, with significant modifications done to both of them. The operator of a EE-03 is free to wear whatever they desire beneath the exoskeleton, so Ross wears his team's jumpsuit and normal headgear. To construct something like this, Ross and his team spent approximately $1,700. 
However, it was assembled with pieces of kits and guns that they already had. But they did use some aluminum tubing and other hardware that they had available. Ross and his fellow teammates, to their knowledge, are the only two owners of such exoskeletons, like this one. But I'm sure that will change soon after this episode because people will get some ideas on how to improve on this loadout fast. The spring-loaded arm design was based on the Steadicam stabilizer design, which completely supports the weight of two guns attached, allowing the operator to transverse and elevate the guns with little effort, much like Luke's smart gun setup. You can aim with the strength of your pinky finger, and since the struts are connected to the boots, the entire suit supports its own weight. This does make the 60-pound loadout weightless on the user, and with the internal upgrades to both the MG42 and the micro gun, you have 70 rounds a second on target at about, you know, 400 feet per second. This is the loadout that people dream about, and that these people had something to say about, including Dayton of the House Gamers channel. I can see someone turning an EE-03 suit into an armored beast, or building a completely different kit around it that would look like it belongs in one of those future set Call of Duties and I say that in an actual good way. My respect goes to the entirety of the Explosives Enterprises Airsoft team for putting something like this together, but with that said, we must move on. Six Spot. Guess what it's based on? It's not modern based, it's not Milsim, and it's not based on anything realistic at all. It's Ghostbusters. It's Ghostbusters. Yep. Vaz actually made this happen, and yes, the Proton Pack actually works, and the wand acts like some kind of BB propelling fire hose. This would be the one and only of its kind, says Vaz. Okay, but where do we start? This kit consists of ecto goggles made from welder's goggles with polycarb lenses that were molded to look like ANPVS5Ss. Then we have a lot more acronyms that I have no idea what they stand for. Like the CWU27P flight suit in tan with no-go sleeve patch and Venkman's Velcro name patch. A pair of black NDT chemical resistant rubber gloves, an M1936 pistol belt in khaki, black jungle combat boots, the proton pack, an Alice rucksack frame with out the rucksack, then the rest of the parts are made from PVC sheet, then molded with some junk electronics and hydraulic parts, and several cast resin parts via Ghostbusters fans. The Proton Pack design plans were made by Stefan Otto, with the wand design being made by Sean Bishop. The Proton Wand has a version 1 gearbox with a 225mm inner barrel and an M249 hop-up chamber that now shoots at 380 feet per second at 25 rounds per second. It does also have a motorized magazine inside the Proton Pack and a feed coil Lonix flash mag inside the Proton Wand. This continues with the main battery located in the crank generator. All the lighting effects work and Vaz even equipped this loadout with speakers and an MP3 player in the pack for added sound effects. All this did cost about $800, but it's very special because it's the only Ghostbusters loadout with a working airsoft proton pack in the world. Not long ago, he did see a video of a Japanese airsoft player with a Ghostbusters loadout, but only had a prop proton pack. So that's definitely a lot to think about, and that's why he made it to the sixth spot. It's for his unique traits and the sweat and hard work that went into this build, and for standing out from hundreds of others. But five other people stood out from those crowds as well, and the first one's coming from France. This is Mephisto's Juggernaut. Taking Modern Warfare 3's campaign ending mission to the extreme, Mephisto's Juggernaut loadout can put a lot of fear into a lot of people on the field for how dominating he stands in any game. You can actually build game modes around the player inside the suit which is really cool, but what makes up this loadout that will probably burn a lot of calories while you wear it? Well, its equipment consists of a padded OTV vest plus a tactical vest on top of that. A helmet with face protection of course, riot leg protectors with the same cut for the arms. Now there is a bit of a language barrier between me and Mephisto, so he couldn't tell me where things came from or what the names are of certain parts but I still kind of understood things. Mephisto also has a padded Spartan skirt and a large neck brace for more protection. Then thousands of more euros went into the fabrics, pads, and sewing work that was done by his wife. This kit doesn't stay in one place though because its owner travels all around the country and other countries, which is nice to hear. Mephisto will travel all around the place to dominate a field like a true airsofter should. It is necessary to create fear in a team you're playing against, 
but if they decide to push regardless, then this kit is there to unlock all sorts of new situations that will shape the game and field entirely. That's not to say that this loadout isn't heavy or hot, but that's a sacrifice you have to make if you want so much power in a game. But I'd say that's a good trade-off to balance things out. But what happens when the once modern layout we see almost every game day changes into something a bit more apocalyptic? Not Fallout apocalyptic either. Get my drift yet? For our fourth and third spots, we have Eddie and Lucas who are going to show us their creativity. From here on in, we'll be taking a look at a lot of handmade crafts that should just be considered art at this point. Eddie will start this trend off with a more humorous look at how he'd take on the new world, as this was built as per the rules of a futuristic slash sci-fi slash post-apocalyptic themed game where you were encouraged to let your imagination just run wild. Now the rifle was built due to Eddie's want for a Lewis gun, but since there isn't one in Airsoft yet, he had to build one himself, and he did so with a futuristic twist with the G&G Firehawk. The rifle build includes a wooden frame attached to the rail system which allows him to screw the big black soil pipe onto the gun. There was enough room inside to mount a light, which was wired to a pressure pad switch near the trigger, allowing Eddie to simulate a sort of flashing effect when firing. Along the top of the pipe, Eddie added a shelving rail and wove a blue neon stripe light through it, again activated by a small button. Then the pan magazine was made by bolting two cake molds together. It was just that easy, and it can hold over 5,000 BBs inside while it gravity feeds through a washing machine tube. From the outfit, Eddie wanted to go big. He wanted a look based on the Mad Max style, so he built everything around a set of American football shoulder pads. He then sourced some cheap alloy chainmail on eBay and used zip ties to put them all together. Eddie screwed on a PC cooling fan onto his back, just for looks, and he added some leg armor and some police riot armor as well. He added a battle kilt from an old scrap piece of Condora attached to a German wide belt. Then the headwear is an old cotton flight helmet with stitched in extra material to make it big enough to fit Eddie's head. He also has a pair of mesh goggles, cheap Halloween bones on a string for the necklace decoration, then to finish the look, why not add a head on a stick? This had all of Eddie's friends impressed, as well as scared at the same time. So bonus points for that, and extra points for keeping your budget as low as 50 pounds sterling. Lucas then turns his apocalyptic segment past 11, from the guns he uses to the clothes he crafts. Starting with a German M40 Stillhelm, painted to fit a mercenary look, and a bandana covered in yellow skulls. The rest of the clothes are from second hand, like the simple black hoodie, and camouflage cargo pants that Lucas cut in two before sewing them onto the arms of the hoodie. Below you would find some common camo pattern cargo pants, with some typical black high punk boots to cap off the first layer. The rig is made of a camel pack as a foundation with a German World War II gas mask canister. Under that, a military style bag from second hand and under that is a Russian gas mask filter just stacked on top of it all. This is then reinforced with straps from military belts Lucas has gathered over the years like the Russian AK pouches he has. As for Lucas's goggles, he bought several different styles from eBay and fitted safe polycarbonate to be able to use them in any airsoft game. Then for weaponry, Lucas made sure that nothing used with this kit could be normal. From the PPSH to the WEAKs and M14, everything has been upgraded properly and worn torn with RE Tech parts inside, paints, burns, agings, and so much more. Just looking at what this builder has done makes everything I own look so basic. And I'm not the kind of airsofter that just stacks M4 rifles in his collection and taunts people about how they should hold their toy guns in a game. Lucas's AKs look the part, his loadout looks the part, and his whole crew looks the part. And that's how he was able to land the third spot. This episode took much longer than I thought it would have when I first began it months ago. Over that time, hundreds of people have submitted, emails have poured in, the first part broke over a thousand likes, and it still gets shared all over my Facebook. But hopefully, these next two builds make it all worth it. As if none of the other loadouts that we've seen already have been worth it. They've all been great and I wish I could have just added more and more into this rendition. But if you like this episode thus far, then be sure to spank that like button like some tempting booty. Next up will be a fan special where anyone can submit any gun build to go up against many other builders who want their builds to be ranked. So keep an eye out for the polls on my Instagram and on the US Airsoft Facebook page that will be linked in the description down below. However, we have two more loadouts to go over, so let's check out Dana 
who has been waiting so long for people to see what he's crafted. I teased this loadout in part 1 and some people thought it was pretty interesting right away. So let's dig into this. Built using Dana's experience as a cosplayer, he made almost everything himself. The exterior clothing was sewn by Dana save for the boots, gloves, balaclava, backpack, and chest rig. The helmet and arm braces were all built by Dana and he even made the katana. This is a cosplay that has survived lightsaber fencing, airsofting, and even martial arts demonstrations. Dana will normally use a D-Boy's Car 98 and a KJW PT-26 with 3D printed plastic throwing stars, which adds even more to this kit. But would you call this an apocalyptic samurai loadout or an apocalyptic ninja? Dana easily has the best photos out of everyone, which really showed off everything we need to be aware of. I love the fact that he made his own katana and that he sewed his own clothes himself, which is not something to be taken lightly, and using this in so many different activities is another plus. Everything just fits well with how it's supposed to look and nothing stands out negatively as if it shouldn't be there. I would advise maybe making the Car 98 look a little bit more worn in or improvised, but that's all I can say. This was still one of the most popular loadouts in the submission polls, and a loadout that the judges really had to look over multiple times before giving it a rank, since it was a bit of a close race between the top spot and the runner-up. Regardless, I'd like to thank Dana for turning in this stunning, nearly $900 loadout. But now it's time for the top spot, and someone in the comments of part 1 called it. He puts together some of the most realistic airsoft guns out there, and he shows you the process on how to put them together on his channel called Real Fake Guns. He's the one who really pushed a post-earth look to the boundaries, and he can show you what can be done in airsoft if you have the drive to make it happen. Introducing Ludwig's trashy, tribal, post-apocalyptic loadout that legitimately looks scary. I wouldn't have expected or even accepted anything less than movie quality from Ludwig, and this loadout is just what I wanted to see turned in. It's nasty and not cheap or just thrown together, and he has this immediate look of dominance, and he just looks like he's about to tear you apart and turn you into a blanket for a pack of dogs. The gear is made from surplus European and Swedish World War II gear, all sorts of different trash and things that he found at flea markets, as well as real bird parts like a necklace made from skulls and jaws. That intimidating mask is an American goalie mask that he added feathers and mesh eyes that he painted with inspiration from the Swedish sci-fi artist Simon Stallenhag. He also added a skeleton jaw from a deer and some paint to weather the whole thing. Nasty. The body armor is just dirt bike protection that Ludwig painted with a primer, then chromed with a thin layer of military gray, added afterwards to give off a worn look. Some things are very random on this character though, like how the left leg is made out of sushi rollers, but that just adds to the trashy look. Then to really drive home that he's a huge 80s fan, he added some Easter eggs onto this outfit, like Skeletor's head from He-Man alongside some animal bones in a necklace. There's also some Akira bike stickers on his right knee pad, the left arm has a Casio calculator on it, which is pretty cool, as seen on the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Total Recall, and of course, the Nintendo Power Glove that I laughed at when I saw it there. Ludwig's guns of choice are also custom with 70% of their parts being from the real firearms that he showcases on his YouTube channel called Real Fake Guns. Just tell me this, who else could have topped Ludwig's GHK RPK with 70% real parts from a 1973 Malat Russian RPK? And a KWA VC-61 Scorpion with a real pistol grip and stock? This guy is just on a narrow world with his work. When I wanted to do unique loadouts, I knew I'd get Milsom stuff and other loadouts that may be rare but not one of a kind truly. But then there was Ludwig, who plopped this man parts on the table and said, this is my house. For this, I grant you the top spot for this episode of the Airsoft Top Series, which is well deserved if I do say so myself. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd say that's a wrap. We've seen just a little bit of what Airsoft has to offer, but I hope that I've been able to showcase just a little bit of the really good stuff. If you think so too, then be sure to spank that like button to show your appreciation or comment down below who had your favorite loadout in this top 20 or in just this top 10. A lot of the builders will read those comments to see what you have to say, so be sure to speak up. 
The next show will be over fan submissions, so anyone can claim a spot if they have a one-of-a-kind gun build that they think should be in the top 10. So be sure to check me out on my Instagram at US Airsoft YouTube or on my Facebook with the links provided in the description. I also need to thank the Airsoft Heretics page for all their help with the show. A link to their Facebook group will also be in the description. And thank you to everyone who submitted, everyone who liked this series, and to you for watching. But until that next video drops from the city of San Antonio, this has been Scott Hollenbeck, and I will be sure to see you all next time.